Are you wondering about the process to applying for an H-1B visa? Well, this webinar is for you. My name is Jorge Molina. I am an immigration attorney based in Dallas-Fort Worth. And today, we will be talking about the process of filing for an H-1B visa. Last week, we were talking about just H-1B visas in general, who qualifies, what are the classifications, and what you need to prove. Today, we're going to be a little more specific and talk about how to actually do this. Okay, so this is, um, we're very excited every year we have that, that we call it the H-1B visa season. It starts around December and it culminates around March and, and April 1st if we're selected for the lottery. So right now we have a lot of questions about, well, you know, do I qualify? What do I need to do? Who should be filing? And all those, uh, all those things. We hope that this webinar is of assistance to answering most of your questions. And if you have any other lingering questions or would like to hire our services, you can always reach us and we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to, to help you if we can. Okay, so, all right, so let's remember. So for, uh, for the H-1B visas, there is a, a, a limitation set by Congress, right, of 65,000 visas um, for new petitions a year, plus an additional 20,000 for individuals with master's degrees from United States institutions. So in general, about 85,000 H-1B visas available. Generally speaking, about five, six times more people apply for these sort of visas than um, that are available. So, you know, to make it fair, to you know who is selected and who's not because the demand is much higher than supply. Um, the immigration authorities have um, ran a lottery for many years, but it used to be a few years ago, and what the way we've been doing it for for you know, years and years was that you know there was sort of like a rush to the mail. You had to file your petition um, to arrive to immigration by April first. You can you can send it. Um, too early or it'll be sent back or you can send it too late or else you know your chances of being selected would dwindle so fortunately a few years ago that system was replaced by an electronic registration system frankly in all fairness i think that that was one of the best changes we've had in this context for a long time so one of the few things that the previous administration um, actually did right. Um, of course, there's some hiccups and everything. Um, not everything works out perfectly, but in my opinion, it's a much better system. So how does it work? Okay, so Citizenship and Immigration Services opens a registration period for no less than 14 years prior, or excuse me, 14 days prior to April 1st. So that means around every year around March 9th, um, Immigration opens the the period to register for this. So, who needs to register? So, it's either the employer or an agent for the employer. The cost of registering is ten dollars, and you do it online. You do it at the um, Citizenship and Immigration Services website. Now, what does that? Uh, what do you need to you know disclose or do? Well, it's basic information about the employer and about the position. And then that is what puts you in the drawing for the lottery, right? So that's how you, you would be selected to, to file a petition. It doesn't mean that you're gonna be approved, but it allows you to file a petition. So let's talk about timing, all right? So so the first date around March 9th every year, that's the time to register. Afterwards, you have, if you're selected, you have 90 days from the date of registry to file your petition. But let me backtrack. So what happens, um, you know, so when do they announce if you're selected? A few, a few days before April 1st, right? So they, they, you know, they announce it in stages. Not everyone's announced at once. Um, so a few days before the filing date or the first initial filing date, which is April 1st, six months before October 1st, um, you would know. What happens if you're not selected? Well, you know, if you have the opportunity to file again the next year, you can always try that again. But not all petitions that are filed get approved. So often, immigration would run another lottery later in the year to see if other people that register 
um, or, or to select other people that registered, right? So, and if you are registering that second or third or fourth or any other subsequent lottery, they'll let you know, give you a, a time of initial um, work date, and then you, you can you can file a petition at that point. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're not selected, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will not be able to file. You know, the odds are is that, you know, very likely you're going to have to wait another year or, or seek another option. But there's still that, you know, slim possibility that later lotteries will, you know, would pick your your case to be filed. Okay, so that's what happens, right? So let's say you're, you're selected. So what do you do? Well, you need a labor um, certification. You need an LCA from the Department of Labor. So in essence... Um, what that does is that um, you know they give you the prevailing wage for the profession they also you explain where the person would be working and you, there's other requirements that you must um, satisfy when with that um, with, with that LCA so one of these is well you need to include it in your petition and another one is that you need to make it public in your office so other employees are aware of what's going on um, you know, we can talk at, you know, at, at, at for hours about these requirements and everything. If you have any questions like this, this is, you know, this is something we'll be happy to help you with. Usually it takes about, I would say, two or three weeks to get the LCA from the Department of Labor. So, you know, time is up the essence. You don't need to necessarily file it um, before you're registered or you're selected to a lottery. It's a good idea, you know, just looking at in, in advance. But... Um, Usually, if you know you're selected, that's the that's the next type of thing that you do. Um, we can always um, file before that, um, and some people choose to do that. So once you have that LCA, um, the next step is to submit the application, the applications to immigration, um, and the accompanying fees. There's many fees that going um, um, in those petitions. I'd rather not quote them right now because they change every year. So the best, or not every year, but often enough so that this you know, recording might not be of help you know, in a few years if they change. So just the best practice is to check with immigration and see what are the fees that are owed. Also, depending on the type of employer, um, you might owe m m you know, more money than others. So it's always important to check what the amount is. So let's say... You file the petition, you include everything. You include the job description, you know, the, the need for this, you you could be a letter from the employer, um, and all the qualifications for the from the potential employee, right? And it gets approved. So what happens then? Right? So if for petitions filed for in April, the start date or the first available date to start would be October first, which is the first year of the of the following fiscal year. So for twenty twenty two we'll be filing for fiscal year twenty twenty three. So, you know, depending on whether the the prospective employee is in the United States or not, there's a few things that you could consider. So let's say you're in a um, you're currently in the United States in a tourist visa and it expires June first. And even though your case was was filed um, and 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 accepted by immigration. Your start date only begins in October first. So if you file a change of status, well, it comes the the time period that your let's say your stay expires in June first. Even if you file a change of status, you're gonna accrue unlawful status for several months, which means that your change of status would be denied. So there's very important considerations um, to keep in mind, depending on your individual um, category. So, but for example, if you're a student and you filed everything timely, you have the opportunity of breaching that time, right? So automatically getting your lawful status extended while you, you're waiting for the H-1B visa. Now, if this is your if this is your case, if you currently are in F-1 status or J-1, or you're completing your OPT, and you're wondering about this, reach out to us. We'll be ha happy to explain it in detail to you. Um, but you know, here's the main question that I get a lot with H-1B. So, what should be my first step? What should I do first? If you're um, prospective employee talk to the employers right so all these filings must be 
um, done by the employer. The employer sh um, has to absorb the cost of filing, including attorney's fees. So if this is an option that you want to pursue, make sure that you have an employer that's willing to file a petition for you and that you're all on the same page. I believe that, that that's the first step. If you're an employer and, and you know that you need to file this visa, start working as soon as possible on um, collecting documents and preparing your case. So as soon as we can register, we can get the bow going. And then we have a pretty clear picture of of um, what it is that we need and, and all the documents that we need to uh, file as well. But anyway, that is in essence the process of filing for H-1B visas. You know, if you're, again, if you're, you, we're starting H-1B visa season right now. So if you have any questions, reach out to us. Again, my name is Jorge Molina. You can always reach us at 469-708-5800. Again, 469-708-5800. You can also um, send us an email at info at jmolinelawfirm.com. Again, info at jmolinelawfirm.com. And it'll be a pleasure helping you. Thank you.